Calculus 3. Calculus 3 takes a look at some different applications and more advanced uses of derivatives and integrals. The actual calculus part of finding derivatives and finding integrals, we're very comfortable with at this point. We know how to do it all. Now we're going to see some uses of it. And uh, chapters 5 and 6 we're going to look at together. And they look at these things called sequences and series. We've got to lay a little bit of foundation with sequence and series first, and then we'll start to see how the calculus plays into these. So first, to start this whole conversation off, we're going to talk about sequences. As we answer the question, how do we work with sequences? And really, what a sequence is is an ordered list of numbers. So for example, 1, 4, 9, 16. We say the first number is 1, the second number is 4, the third number is 9, the fourth number is 16. They're in order. In fact, we usually label them. Uh, a sub 1 is the first number. A sub 2 is the second number. A sub 3 is the third number. And A sub 4 is the fourth number, and so on. Well, with calculus, we're often interested in the infinite. So let's take a look at what is called an infinite sequence. The idea of an infinite sequence is the sequence really never ends. It starts with the first term, then you'll see the second term, then you'll see the third term, and we'll keep going on and on and on forever. There's no last term. There's a first term, but no last term. And we'll often express the infinite sequence in one of two ways. We can use what's called an explicit formula. which can define each term. You'll often see a sub n is equal to some function that defines each term at that function. So if we want the fifth term, a sub 5, we would just plug 5 into the function. So for example, In this sequence I have up above, 1, 4, 9, 16, you might notice those are all the perfect squares. So we could express that as a sub n equals n squared. And then when I want a sub 1, that's n. The first term is 1 squared or 1. When I want the second term, we plug 2 in. We have 2 squared, which is 4. When I want the third term, we want 3 squared, which is 9. We're just plugging the subscript into the function to find out what that term is. This way, we could quickly find the 10th term by plugging 10 in. 10 squared is 100. That's an explicit formula. And we could keep going on and on and on with those. But another way to express them is what's called a recurrence relation. Which can define each term based on a previous term. So for example, we might say, OK, the first term is equal to 1. And then the nth term is equal to the previous term, a sub n minus 1 plus 2n minus 1. 
So to get the next term, we have to know the previous term. And so we can build this recurrence relation one term at a time based on what happened previously. So here, for example, a sub 1 we already know is 1. So a sub 2, the second term, is the previous term, which is 1 plus 2 times the term number, which is 2, minus 1. This makes the second term 4. If I want the third term, a sub 3, we take the previous term, which was 4, plus 2 times the term number 3, minus 1. And this becomes 4 plus 6 minus 1, which is 9. And what you might notice is we're really building the same sequence. This is the perfect squares, 1, 4, 9. The next one's going to be 16. So there's different ways to represent the same sequence, both explicitly and as a recurrence relation in terms of the previous terms. Now, there are a couple sequences that are very important to us. And so we're going to look at them separately. We're going to look at what's called the arithmetic sequence. And the idea of the arithmetic sequence is we have a common difference added to the previous term. So for example, I might have the number 5, then 8, then 11, then 14, and so on. And what you see is happening in this sequence is we have a common difference of 3 that's being added to each term to get to the next term. 5 plus 3 is 8. 8 plus 3 is 11. 11 plus 3 is 14. We're adding 3 to get each term. And we can represent an arithmetic sequence here with recursion by saying, OK, the first term is equal to 5. So the nth term is equal to the previous term. And as we said above, we're just going to always add 3 to the previous term. Maybe we could generalize this and say the first term is the first term, whatever that is. And the next term is the previous term plus that common difference. Although we also know how to express this with an explicit formula. The explicit formula is going to be that any given term is equal to what we really have is a linear relationship. We're going by 3 each time. We really have a y equals mx plus b situation, where we can take the common difference as our slope. And we're going to have to say n minus 1 plus the y-intercept, or the starting value of 5. Now, we have to do n minus 1 instead of n with this y equals mx plus b because we don't call the first term the 0th term, but the y-intercept is the 0th term. So we're kind of staggered off by one unit. So what we really have is our slope or common difference. And we have our y-intercept, or our starting number. Often we call that b. So maybe generally we would say a sub n is equal to the common difference times n minus 1 plus the first term. That's the arithmetic sequence. Another important sequence, though, that we work with is called the geometric sequence. If the arithmetic sequence has a common difference that's always added, the geometric sequence has a common ratio 
that is multiplied. So for example, we've got 4, negative 12, 36, negative 108, and so on. What you see here is from to move from one term to the next term to the next term, we have a common ratio that we're multiplying by. We're multiplying each term by negative 3 to get the next term. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. Negative 12 times negative 3 is 36, and so on. Well, if I wanted to express this with a recurrence relationship, we again will say, well, the first term is equal to 4. And then to get that, oops, sorry, the first term, not the nth term. The first term is equal to 4. And then to get the nth term, we just take the previous term, n minus 1, and multiply by that common difference of negative 3. Maybe generally we say the first term is the first term, and the nth term is that common ratio times the previous term. But we can also express this with an explicit formula. Here, we're multiplying by the same number over and over again. Repeated multiplication, we should know, is an exponential. So we can take our first term times the ratio to the n minus 1 power, telling us we multiply by negative 3 over and over and over again. Here we have to do n minus 1 because the 4, the first term, a sub 1, is not multiplied by negative 3. So if we plug 1 in for the n, you'll notice 1 minus 1 is 0, negative 3 to the 0 is 1, and we're just left with 4 for the first term. So we've got to be careful sometimes with that n minus 1 bit. So kind of generally, um, an explicit formula for a geometric sequence is the first number times the ratio to the n minus 1 gives us that geometric sequence. We might even label that the 4 is the first term and the 3 is the ratio. OK, so if that's a geometric sequence, we're ready to actually start combining what we know about arithmetic and geometric and also pattern recognition. We're going to see if we can build and find explicit formulas. And as we do this, our general strategy is to just look for patterns and do a little guess and check. Because sometimes you have to try stuff. Is the exponent in? Is it n minus 1? Is it n plus 1? Let's guess and check a few and see how we do. So for example, if I have negative 1 half, comma 2 thirds, comma negative 3 fourths, comma 4 fifths, comma negative 5 sixths, we're going to break this down and see what we observe. First thing I observe is it's alternating. It's going from negative to positive to negative to positive to negative. And the way we can generate an alternating sequence like this is we just take negative 1 raised to an exponent. Now, I always check the first term. The first term is negative. So if I plug 1 in for n, negative 1 to the first power is negative. If the first term was positive, we'd need to use n plus 1 so that we shift the negative sign down 1. So the first thing we saw is that we're alternating. Second thing I observe here is I just look at the numerators. The numerators are counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Well, what we see is the first term has a numerator of 1, the second term has a numerator of 2, the third is 3, the fourth is 4. That's just n. The term number is the numerator, 1, 2, 3, 4, 
5. When I look at the denominators, they're a little different. The denominators go 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I see the denominators are kind of a shift of 1. They don't start, the first term doesn't start at 1. The first term starts at 2. It's always 1 more than the term number. It's n plus 1. So the fifth term has a denominator of 6, 1 more than that. And so when I put it all together, what we end up with is that the nth term is alternating negative 1 to the n times the numerator of n divided by the denominator of n plus 1. And this becomes the explicit formula for our series. Let's try another one to see if we can continue finding these patterns. Let's do 3 fourths, 9 sevenths, 27 over 10, 81 over 13, and so on. If I look just at the numerators again, The numerators are 3, 9, 27, 81. What I see is those are powers of 3. 3 to the first, 3 to the second, 3 to the third, 3 to the fourth. And that exponent is always matching the term numbers. So 3 to the n seems to create my numerators. So for the fourth term, 3 to the fourth is 81 in the numerator. In the denominator, we've got 4, 7, 10, 13. 4, 7, 10, 13. What I notice there is we are adding 3 to get the next term. If we're adding 3 to get the next term, what we actually have is an arithmetic sequence. My arithmetic sequence says I can take the common difference of 3 times n minus 1 plus the starting number of 4. Well, let's simplify. If I distribute the 3, 3n three minus 3 plus 4, combining like terms, we have 3n plus 1. So when I combine this together, any term, the numerator is 3 to the n. The denominator is 3n plus 1. And we've got an explicit formula for what's going on with this sequence. Let's do another example then. Let's try 2 over 2. I know it's not reduced, but we're going to go with it. Negative 4 over 10, 12 over 50, and negative 48 over 250. and so on. Again, the first thing that I'll notice on something like this is we're going from positive to negative to positive to negative. We're alternating again. To get an alternating sequence, we take negative 1 to some exponent. The problem is, is we've got our first term, second term, third term, fourth term. Notice if we use the term number of 1, plugging 1 in for n, negative 1 to the first power is negative 1. Our first term is not negative. Our first term is positive. We've got the wrong signs. We're set up for negative, positive, negative, positive. And this one's positive, negative, positive, negative. So to shift by 1, we just need to add 1 to the exponent. Now when we plug 1 in, we get 1 plus 1 is 2, and negative 1 squared is a positive 1. And we're set up for a positive-negative alternation. Let's look at the numerators. 2, 4, 12, 48. To go from 2 to 4, 
you might notice we multiply by 2. But from 4 to 12, we multiply by 3. And from 12 to 48, we multiply by 4. We're multiplying by one more number. To get to 48, we have 4 times 3 times 2. To get to 12, we have 3 times 2. Notice that counting down of multiplication, we should recognize that as a factorial. To get the fifth term, it should be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. However, this doesn't quite work because the first term isn't 1. The first term is 2. Plugging 1 in, 1 factorial is 1. How do we get a 2? Well, let's shift by multiplying that by 2. Let's see if that works. Let's test that out on the third term. The third term has a numerator of 12. Well, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6, times 2 is 12. And it looks like we've got our numerators figured out. All that's left to look at then is the denominator. The denominators are 2, 10, 50, 250, 2, 10, 50, 250. And what you might see there is we seem to be multiplying by 5 every time. We know that if we're multiplying by 5 every time, that's a geometric sequence where we take our first term times the ratio to the n minus 1. And now, if we put all of that together, we can say the nth term is negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2n factorial over 2 times 5 to the n minus 1. But one thing you might notice, we've got 2s in both the numerator and denominator. We can divide those 2s out. So a reduced formula then becomes negative 1 to the n plus 1 n factorial over 5 to the n minus 1. So that's kind of how we can play and observe patterns in order to find the nth term of any geometric or any sequence, really, whether it's geometric, arithmetic, or neither. But sometimes we're more interested in, as these terms go out, as these terms get to the infinitieth term, kind of what's the last term approaching? We call this the limit of the sequence. Are the terms getting closer and closer to some number? Are they asymptotically getting closer to some value? Or what is the infinitieth term? Well, to do that, we will say if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n of all the terms is equal to some limit l, that means the sequence is approaching l as n becomes large. If this happens, if it approaches a specific limit, we say then the sequence is convergent, or the sequence converges to a specific number. Kind of the opposite case, then, is if the limit as n goes to infinity of the terms does not approach a value l. It is called a divergent sequence. Let's do some examples. Got quite a few of these to look at. Let's take 
the explicit formula of 1 minus 1 half raised to the n power. Well, if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 half to the n power, we end up with 1 minus, and 1 half times 1 half times 1 half is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That's approaching 0. And so 1 minus 0 equals 1. Therefore, as n gets really large, these terms are getting closer and closer to 1. We can say that this series converges, or the sequence converges, sorry, converges to 1. Let's try the sequence 1 plus 3n. Well, if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 3n, well, we know that becomes 1 plus 3 times as n gets huge, it becomes infinity. Basically, these numbers are just going to get bigger and bigger because we're always just adding 3 each time. This sequence diverges because it goes off to infinity. How about the sequence 3n to the fourth minus 7n squared plus 5 over 6 minus 4n to the fourth? Well, if we took the limit as n goes to infinity of that entire thing, we know from our work with limits that the largest exponent is going to take over. And that largest exponent is the fourth powers. And basically, the fourth powers take over, and we get 3 over negative 4. And this series does converge. I'm sorry, this sequence does converge to negative 3 fourths. Now, we have a good friend named L'Hopital that can help us with these as well. Let's say we've got a sequence that's 2 to the n power over n squared. We would try and take the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 to the n over n squared to see if it approaches a value. But the numerator goes off to infinity, and the denominator goes off to infinity. So what we can do is we can apply L'Hopital's rule and take the derivative of the numerator and denominator and see what limit that gives us. The derivative of 2 to the n is 2 to the n times the natural log of 2 over the derivative of n squared is 2n. But those still are each going off to infinity. So that doesn't help us. So I guess we'll take another derivative. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity. The derivative of 2 to the n is still 2 to the n natural log of 2 times the constant natural log of 2 all over the derivative of the denominator, which is 2. And now what you see happening is the numerator Natural log of 2 squared, that's just a constant. Divided by 2, that's just a constant. But this numerator, 2 to the n, goes off to infinity. We have infinity divided by 2, which is still infinity. So this series, or this sequence, diverges. The sequence diverges because it goes to infinity. Let's do one more with our friend L'Hopital. Let's say the nth term is 5n squared plus 1 over e to the n. Again, the numerator is off to infinity, and the denominator is off to infinity. So we can use L'Hopital's rule to say that the limit as n goes to infinity is the derivative 10n over the derivative e to the n. But as n goes to infinity, these are still both going off to infinity. So we'll do L'Hopital's rule again. The limit as n goes to infinity of 10 over e to the n. And now when we plug infinity in, 
e to the infinity is infinity. We're taking 10 divided by a very large number. Basically, we end up with 0. This sequence converges. It's a convergent series. Now, sometimes we can't just take the limit very clearly and see what it's approaching. So we need a slightly different strategy. And there is another nice strategy that we can use sometimes, not always, but it works out nice when it does, with what are called bounded sequences. And the idea of a bounded sequence is all the terms are smaller than a constant. That's called bounded above, because they're never going to be bigger than this constant number. And or all the terms are larger than a constant. And that's what we call bounded below. For example, a sub n equals 1 over n is bounded above by 1 and below by 0. What you see is the first term when we plug 1 in is 1 over 1, which is 1. Then it's 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth. They're going to get smaller and smaller, but they're never going to get to 0. So it's always smaller than 1, bounded above by 1, but always bigger than 0, bounded below by 0. And this idea of being bounded is very useful because of what we call the monotone convergence theorem. If we are bounded above, means I'm never larger than some number, and increasing, so I'm always getting larger, then the sequence converges. Kind of visually, what we're talking about is, let's say we're bounded above by some constant. We'll call it c. And my series is always increasing, but it's never going to get bigger than that constant. You can see it's going to kind of converge to that constant. It's approaching some number. And really, the opposite is also true if we are bounded below and decreasing, then the sequence converges. And visually, that's almost the same thing. We've got some constant c. And the series is always decreasing. I'm sorry, the sequence is always decreasing. But it's never going to pass that c. It's going to get closer and closer to that c. We see it converges at that point. Let's do one example where we can see this work out. Let's say a sub n is equal to 4 to the n over n factorial. 
Okay. What we'll do then is we'll look at the next term to see if it's getting smaller or getting bigger. The next term, oops, the next term, a sub n plus 1, is equal to 4 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. But we can break that up a little bit. 4 to the n plus 1 is really 4 times 4 to the n over. And n plus 1 factorial is really the n factorial, or let's, if we break it out into its terms, the first term is n plus 1. Break it out into its factors, not terms times the next term is n, then n minus 1, n minus 2. That's really n factorial, which means we've broken this up into two fractions. We have 4 over n plus 1 times 4 to the n over n factorial. What we see is we're taking the previous term and multiplying it by 4 over n plus 1. When we multiply by 4 over n plus 1 with large numbers of n, because we're always interested at infinity, if n is large, 4 over n plus 1, we're really multiplying by a really small number. We're multiplying by 4 over infinity. We're, we're not really multiplying by much. It's always going to be positive. 4 over n plus 1 is getting smaller. But never negative. This means we are bounded below by 0 and decreasing. Each term is smaller than the previous term because we multiply by some fraction, 4 over a large number. And it's smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's decreasing, 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 but it's never going to pass 0. So therefore, by the monotone convergence theorem, we know, therefore, the sequence converges. And that's how we can use the monotone convergence theorem. So this is a little introduction to sequences. In our next video, we're going to look at what we can do with sequences in a little bit more of a useful fashion. But today, we're just trying to get familiar with using those sequences, expressing them as an explicit formula, finding out if they converge. So take a look at your homework, practice a few of these, and we'll discuss them more in class.